It's a mailbag episode on today's edition of Locked On Pirates, answering your questions about the Pittsburgh Pirates and more. So, with the signing of Aroldis Chapman, where do the Pirates go from here, and where are they now? We're going to talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Pirates. You are Locked On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome back, everybody, to the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team, your Pittsburgh Pirates every day. My name is Ethan Smith. You can follow me right there on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan, because guess what? I'm always bringing you all of your news, analysis, opinions, and reactions to everything going on in the world of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And today's episode of Locked On Pirates is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make sure you go place a $5 bet and get $150 in bonus bets instantly, win or lose, over at FanDuel. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. And on today's episode, I'm playing mailman. I'm playing uh, sender here. I'm playing reading the mail. I I went to the mailbox and I got all the mail out. And all all of a sudden, I got a bunch of questions from you guys. I did ask you guys to put in some questions this week for me for a mailbag episode. I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to ask me some questions and also have them answered here on today's episode. So here we are talking about that. Also this week, make sure you go check out the two episodes that I did on Aroldis Chapman and the bullpen as a whole. You guys seem to really enjoy those a lot as well. And we're going to get right into the questions today. Uh, And really, a lot of these questions I do have pretty long answers to. So bear with me just a little bit because there was some research that went behind these questions as well. But we're going to get started with Corey Quaglietta. Hopefully I pronounced your last name right, Corey. But he asked, with first baseman Reese Hoskins going to Milwaukee on a two-year pact and the Orioles showing interest in starting pitcher Michael Lorenzen, where does Pittsburgh go from here? They need a number five starter and need to address center field and first base. I don't know if I trust Telez at first. Your thoughts? Well, Corey, obviously, thank you for that question and the multitude of questions there, really, that can be derived from talking about uh, your thoughts there. And for starters, I personally think One, that the Pirates were never interested in Reese Hoskins. Now, I know that a lot of fans were. I was a person that wouldn't have been entirely upset if the Pirates would have went out and got Reese Hoskins. But you also have to remember that Reese Hoskins is a guy that dealt with injury all last season, missed the entire year, and realistically, breaking it down based off of other candidates, I don't even really want to say that Hoskins is the most most bona fide best candidate over at first base. And we'll stick there for a moment because there may be steam and there have been rumors that Carlos Santana wants to return to the Pittsburgh Pirates or a place uh, based on reports and rumors indicating that he would like to return to somewhere he's played before. He's played in Pittsburgh before he was here last year. And if you see the thumbnail of the show, you'd see that he was in a Pirates uniform before And Santana is available. He's still a free agent. And quite honestly, in the short term for what the Pirates want at first base and what they truly need, especially with a running mate with Rowdy Telez, I just think Carlos Santana, even at his age, just offers a bit more than Hoskins all around at this moment. You look at Carlos Santana last year. He was a gold glove finalist, had a plus two outs above average defensively last year, while Hoskins, who again missed 2023 due to injury, was a negative nine outs above average player in 2022 at first base. Not exactly the number that you want to hear when you're looking for a guy to platoon alongside Rowdy Telez, who is also not the greatest outs above average player in the world either. You also look at Hoskins posting 30 home runs in 2022. That was one of the big sticking points for a lot of people wanting to get a guy like Reese Hoskins. He had this, he has that 30 plus home run power and Santana though has had 19 plus the last three years with a plus outs above average in those three seasons. So I always like with these mailbag shows to kind of give a question back to you after hearing that, who would you rather have, especially with Santana likely being the much cheaper option? I think I'm going to go Carlos Santana there. And 
Him coming back isn't unlikely. It's been something that has been rumored. It has been thrown around that the Pittsburgh Pirates are interested in a reunion with Carlos Santana. He very much enjoyed being with this team last year before being traded to Milwaukee at the trade deadline. He got a taste of the postseason again. He got a taste of the postseason with Seattle. He was there with Cleveland as well. He's a veteran that has playoff experience and is also just a very good clubhouse player. And also don't forget, folks, that he performed well in Pittsburgh last year. He performed well in Milwaukee last year. So don't let that age scare you with a guy like Carlos Santana because really last year he played himself into being a viable option for whoever gets him. And if it's the Pirates, he will be a viable option, even if he is a slight regression candidate. And you can listen to my show yesterday where I say that slight regression does not mean that a guy is going to be bad. Regression is just part of the sport of baseball. And I keep an eye on it for sure with Rowdy Telez's defensive shortcomings, and maybe it does happen soon with the Carlos Santana reunion. We don't know, but it's something that I think we definitely have to keep our eyes peeled on, and something else that a lot of people have been keeping their eyes peeled on is the Michael Lorenzen stuff that's been going on uh, lately right now with you mentioning, of course, Corey, that the Baltimore Orioles are also interested in Michael Lorenzen. The Pirates are also potentially interested in Michael Lorenzen as well. That's about as far as I'll go with that. And as far as Lorenzen goes, I've been in since it was rumored. I mean, he's a sub-425 ERA guy the past two seasons, and he has 18-plus starts those past two years as well. His advanced metrics obviously leave a ton to be desired. You can go look at his stat cast and see a lot of blue and see what I'm talking about. But one thing he does well that I love is that he limits the walks while having a high chase rate. And you look at a guy like this, and you see that his estimated market value on spot track is around $9.2 million. You just saw the Pirates give a number just above that to Aroldis Chapman just three days ago. So some would wonder, hey, why didn't you just give this to Michael Lorenzen or another starting pitcher instead of Aroldis Chapman? Again, I'm going to keep plugging that episode from yesterday on the why the Chapman deal was, one, a very good one, and two, the money doesn't matter all that much. And the Pirates do have, I would say, now a pretty unique pitch to any starting pitcher to want to come to Pittsburgh because with that Chapman signing, you're highlighting the back end of a bullpen that can shorten games for these starters to where they're not going to be asked to pitch seven or eight innings every day. You're going to be asking, or every start, you're going to be asking these guys to pitch five, maybe six innings at best at times and then hand it off to the strong bullpen that the Pirates have at their disposal. Lorenzen is one of my top picks. Don't get me wrong left in the FA pool, but not at all the be-all, end-all. There are still options there. Obviously, I think the Pirates won't be able to afford guys like Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery, but you look at Vince Velasquez, who's available, and he performed well last year with Pittsburgh before he got injured. You look at another name like Mike Clevenger, who had an impressive 3.77 ERA in 24 starts last year, and suddenly the options continue to grow. And then a name that I also wanted to throw out there that I think would be drastically cheap, and you could potentially get as an NRI, is Zach Davis who, yes, had a horrid season last year with a 7 ERA, but he has a 4-3-6 career ERA and has shown he can have success. And that's something that I do want to tell a lot of people, and I want to uh, kind of finish off with your question here, Corey, is any signing that they make for a starter at this point or a trade is not going to be the sexy signing that everybody in MLB is going to rave over. Martin Perez really isn't that. Marco Gonzalez really isn't that. But that's not what the Pirates need. They just need guys to go out there and eat innings. They need guys to go out there and be efficient in five or six inning stints and starts. And that's it. And there are options there in free agency still, including Michael Lorenzen, Mike Clevenger, Corey Kluber, Vince Velasquez, Zach Davies. There's a lot of different guys that are affordable that the Pirates could still go out and get. And then that's not even counting if they go out and go on the trade market for a guy like potentially Brady Singer if they want to go out and do that or go talk to Miami about Edward Cabrera or Jesus Lazardo, There are things that can be done there for the Pittsburgh Pirates to do this. And I'd expect at least one, maybe two more moves before spring training kicks off while 
with, to me, Santana's return being the likeliest of the bunch for these moves. Now, obviously, I do think they'll add some kind of pitcher before spring or uh, before spring training or before the season starts because I also agree that one more starter is a definite and probably still the biggest need of this roster, a need I think that they'll patch one way or another. But, Corey, I hope that was a big, answer, a big enough answer for you because it filled up the whole segment. And honestly, again, I'm excited to see if Carlos Santana comes back. I'm excited to see if the Pirates stay in the Michael Lorenzen sweepstakes, and I'm excited to see what they do to patch these holes and if they do have more moves under their belt. But in the next segment, we're going to continue answering all of your questions. The next big question being about the positives going into 2024 and what we have to look forward to going into this season. But before we do that, folks, we're going to talk about FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook is your number one place to do all of your sports betting this year because guess what, folks? It's AFC and NFC Championship Week. The Ravens take on the Chiefs. The Lions take on the 49ers, which means the playoffs are wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab, make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup because FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL and an official sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network. And folks, also make sure that you check out Locked On Sports Today on YouTube. It is the first ever 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube dedicated to the Locked On Podcast Network where you can find all these shows, including mine, Chris Carter over at Locked On Steelers, Nick Farbaugh over at Locked On Pit, Hunter Hodes over at Locked On Penguins, and any other sports interests that you may have. It's all going to be streaming on Locked On Sports Today on YouTube, so make sure to go check it out. We're going to go right into the next question here on Mailbag Thursday is what we're just going to call it for now. But I do think that I want to make Mailbag Friday a staple during the season. So keep an eye out for that. And Robert Haglin Jr. asks or says and asks, there's a lot of negativity in Pirates Twitter. Being one of the positive voices, what aspect of the organization are you most pleased with? Also, are Je is Jello a dessert, or just a vessel for alcohol? I'll answer the last part at the end. Uh, I appreciate you uh, for recognizing uh, my positivity about this baseball team. I always try to be that way. That is what I want to be for all of you. I just also want you to know that I'm not afraid to call the organization out. I'm not afraid to call stupid things out about this team, but I do try to remain as positive as possible about the Pittsburgh Pirates because I think that's just how it should be. It should be positive discourse when needed, which is needed a lot more often. As far as an aspect of the organization that I'm pleased with, I'm going to go back right now to last year and the year before. Now, I know that's a little interesting because, you know, the last two years have not exactly – last year had a lot to talk about, but the year prior, not so much. But I do go back to 2023 and 2022 for an important reason because the Pirates went against the grain for the first time in quite a while. Uh, signing key Brian Hayes to a long-term extension. The Brian Reynolds drama, obviously, you had that saga go on for what felt like forever. But those guys are here to stay for a while now on long-term deals. You also have the potential of locking up guys like O'Neill Cruz in the future. You have Mitch Keller, who I keep saying they need to go ahead and get him locked up on an extension before he prices himself out of Pittsburgh. Just go look at the starting pitching market this year. And if they get those done... I mean, I think you're really talking about the narrative um, changing a bit on how they handle their best players because the whole joke is that O'Neill Cruz will be a Yankee in six years and Paul Skeens will be a Dodger in six years. And, all, you know, the, all the jokes that you hear all the time. 
But if they start getting some of these guys locked into long-term extensions like they've already done with a guy like he, Brian Hayes, and their other star player, Brian Reynolds, then that narrative starts to change a bit. And I think that the positivity amongst the organization and its fans would start to change a little bit as well. But as far as heading into 2024, I think the optimism and all the optimism needs to be spread around because it's been risen to a level we haven't seen in quite a while. It really has. I mean, you look at the last time this team made the playoffs. I was in high school when this team made the playoffs. Now I'm 25. Just put that into perspective. Last time the Pirates were in the play, the Pirates were in the playoffs in 2015. That was the last time. They've had one winning season since then. Lots of different things have changed since then. But you look into this year and you say, what is there to be positive about and what is the optimism around this team for? Well, let me just name a few names. You have Henry Davis, Leover Piguero, O'Neill Cruz, Jack Sawinski, Edward Olivares, and that's just to name a few who could be potential breakout candidates this year. You're looking at the potential that young guys like Anthony Solomedo and Chang and Jared Jones and Paul Skeens and maybe even Termar Johnson, who we're going to talk about in the third segment, as potential guys that could come up here and make a real impact. And this is also without Johan Oviedo and Eddie Rodriguez because of injuries. You have options around the diamond now. This is not the world that we've lived in, the Pirates world that we've lived in over the past couple of years where you're looking at certain position groups and you're saying, this doesn't look good. Now, obviously, I mean, you can still say that about right field. You can still say that about first base and second base if you really want to. But none of these guys are really going to be guys that you're going to shun away from. You have these guys that have upside, at least. You're forcing position battles rather than settling for the Josh Van Meters of the world. And when you go into spring, I mean, spring is right around the corner, folks. Pitchers and catchers report in a couple weeks. You have a, and I've talked about this a lot, you have real position battles in the rotation second base, and right field with a plethora of options at each position. Now, are they all, quote-unquote, good options? Not necessarily, but most of the options they have at those positions at least make you think, what's the guy's upside? Can he actually be the answer? So going into 2024, I just say to everybody, have a positive mindset because the team is telling you that they want to compete. They've said it themselves. They want to be a competitive baseball team in 2024 and feel like they have the tools and have been adding the tools to make that happen. So believe that and let the proof be in the pudding and let it play out on the baseball field. Now to answer the second part, Jello is a staple for me at buffets as a dessert and a night on the town, so it can be both. It can be both a venture for alcohol. It can be a dessert. I think it can be both. Rick Bosworth comes in with a fun question. If the Pirates were to finish strong this offseason and acquire a legit starting pitcher via trade, Miami, Toronto, as potential suitors, sign Velasquez, Santana, and Taylor, what would you think of their prospects for next year? Well, for starters, Rick, I love the optimism. I do. But I just can't confidently say that they would do all of those things. I just don't think they financially would, and I just don't think that you really want to have the massive decisions roster-wise that you would want to have there. So I'll pitch a question back to you, Rick. Which of those to you, in your opinion, is of the utmost importance to help better this roster? And I'll answer it because I think the obvious answer, I'd say, is acquiring another starter. But it doesn't hurt to look at the other options that could also help this team out. Santana is a hit if they do it. He's been here. He's shown that he can play well here. He's a great clubhouse guy. He's a good defensive um, platoon partner with Rowdy Telez. And I spoke about this already. So let's look at Michael A. Taylor for a second, a name that I haven't mentioned on this show in quite a bit. Now, Brian Reynolds and Jack Sawinski are both very talented. Very, very talented individuals. But I don't think anybody would exactly consider them outfielders that are plus defenders. Now, Michael A. Taylor is. He just is. He had a nine outs above average last year while hitting 21 home runs. Now, the average could be better. The OPS could be better. The stuff like that could be better. 
But what was the last time that the Pirates truly had a field general in the outfield? Starley Marte, Andrew McCutcheon. It's it's tough to say. So Taylor, with an addition, if the Pirates decide to do it, would also, by proxy, really just help the right field need as well because you'd slide Sawinski over there, which would in turn probably help his defense with the small uh, amount of right field that you have to deal with. And suddenly your outfield becomes a strength not only offensively but defensively. Michael A. Taylor, folks, is one of the best defensive outfielders in all of baseball. And he has 20-plus home run power every single year. Now, for those who have worries about Taylor's bat, folks, he had an 88th percentile barrel rate last season despite his minus 10 bat running value. He struggles on whiff rate and strikeout rate for sure. But again, this is a guy who's always been known to play plus defense and has long ball potential. But again, to your question, a starter is and has been the biggest need for this team all offseason. They've added two. The Oviedo injury made them now have to add three because if Johan Oviedo was not hurt, I'd be fine with how the rotation is right now. And I think a lot of you would be because then you're talking about one of the three of Quinn Priest or Luis Ortiz or Contreras being involved and not potentially two. But the Pirates likely have to choose one of the options that you gave. And if they do more, I'll be more than pleased. If they go out and get Carlos Santana and a starter, folks, I'll be, I'll be very excited. If they go out and get Michael A. Taylor or a starter, I'll be very excited. If they go out and get Michael A. Taylor and Carlos Santana, I'll be fine with it. I'll still say I want another starter because I think that's warranted. But those are all things that I think are perfectly fine to want the Pirates to do. And again, as I said earlier, I think Santana is of the most likelihood. I think adding a starter is still going to happen. Michael A. Taylor is something that could potentially happen. But it's worth noting and worth talking about. I really think it is. Because the offseason's not near over, folks. We still have January. Pitchers and catchers report on Valentine's Day. Spring training starts at the end of February. Still got time. And I also still have time for one more question that we're going to answer here on our final segment of today's episode of Locked on Pirates. But, of course, a word from our sponsors. And folks, welcome back to the final segment of today's episode of Locked On Pirates here on the Locked On Podcast Network. I always love to thank my loyal third segment listeners for always tuning into this show in its entirety, as you all should. Again, it's a free show, 30 minutes a day. Gotta love it. We're going back to five days a week in February, which means we're going to be in in in-season mode. It's going to be very fun. We're going to have a lot of fun, folks. It's going to be a big year for Locked On Pirates and the Pittsburgh Pirates this year, folks. I think it is. And I'm also going to be uh, talking about some news here pretty soon about some stuff that I might be trying to dabble in that involves the Pittsburgh Pirates. So we'll talk about that at a later date. But I want to get to F. Stover's question. Stover, always love your questions, man. He just simply asks, what is Termar Johnson ceiling this year level-wise he puts in parentheses? So... I kind of like that he put the level-wise in there because a lot of people would say, what's Termar ceiling? Well, you know, he's the top-rated second-base prospect in all of baseball and a guy whose bat tools will have any hitting coach salivate, so obviously his ceiling is going to be high. And it's going to be an interesting campaign for Termar Johnson because he batted two forty four last year with an eight sixty OPS. He had 18 homers, 59 RBIs. He did really well last year. Now, He's 19 years old, so stats really, to me, don't matter all that much. But when you have an OPS sitting at a career 840 in your first two minor league seasons, you're going to open some eyes. And obviously, scouts agree, and he was the number four overall pick in the draft two years ago, and he had the hit tool that a lot of people said he was the best hitter in the draft, and that's why the Pirates took him. And again, when you evaluate Termar Johnson right now, you have to consider some things. He hasn't played above high A Greensboro yet, and he's only 19. 
And he's played 128 games, so he has some games under his belt, but that doesn't really equate to a full season yet. And that's where I'd expect him really to begin 2024 again is in Greensboro. Because as many of you who follow the minor league system know, Greensboro usually does amplify a player's bats due to the nature of that ballpark. It's just a hitters-friendly ballpark. It always raises ERAs for pitchers and raises averages for hitters. That's just what that ballpark does. So I would expect him to get a fast call up to Altoona. I would say probably May, like mid-May, early June is when you would expect that kind of call up from Altoona. And that's when I truly start evaluating Tamar because double A is a place where even the Pirates organization has truly started evaluating a lot of their players. I mean, you look at Henry Davis, Andy Rodriguez, and a lot of these guys that have been called up and a lot of their evaluation process was from double A Altoona, sometimes even skipping over triple A Indianapolis. Now Johnson does have improvements to make as most 19 year old baseball players do. His biggest improvements will have to come, though, from dropping his 26% strikeout rate. Now, again, that's in 128 games. Sample size is a big play there, but that's also a problem we've seen Nick Gonzalez deal with as well. The difference, though, for Termar Johnson, outside of Nick Gonzalez at least, is that Johnson has a walk rate of 21.9%, which led to an impressive 422 on base percentage last year. So. When you're amongst the top 10 second base prospects in MLB pipeline, you're going to start getting compared to guys. And Johnson has the hit tool. We know that. He's also tied among those top 10 second base prospects on MLB pipeline for the best fielding tool at 55. And yes, before you ask, he's a second baseman. He's not going to play shortstop. I just don't think he can. Maybe he moves somewhere else around. He's still young enough to do so. We'll see. But once Johnson gets to Altoona, that's when I think we'll know what his ceiling for 2024 is. If he torches double A pitching and fields well, I would expect a call up to Indy around midsummer, say late June, early July, where his play there could have a similar trajectory to what we saw from O'Neill Cruz in 2022 or in 2021, sorry, when O'Neill Cruz came up for those like final five games of the year and got that little cameo and that taste of major league action and then started in the minors again and didn't come up until the midseason. That's something I think the term R could also deal with as well because we know the two favorite words, Super 2, are going to get brought up about this garbage, but it's fine. But that's his ceiling, I think, really, is a cameo appearance at the big league level. That's what I think you could come to expect. Now, obviously, if none of Lee over Piguero, Nick Gonzalez, G1 Bay, or Jared Triolo truly take over the second base spot and Termar is playing well enough, maybe it happens sooner. But a ton of factors go into this stuff when it's co- it comes to calling up a kid this early. I mean, I do think that I can confidently say Termar will be here in 2025, but I wouldn't rule out seeing him in black and gold in 2024. And the kid is just talented. He really is. Scouts know it. The Pirates know it. I know it. You know it. And he'll be a spotlighted prospect all year. And I will be highlighting it on my show every now and then about what he's doing. And I urge all of you to get MILB, uh, MILB MILB.TV and tune in when you can this year, because I mean, watching Termar is going to be fun. And I'm happy that you guys gave me such great questions to really uh, talk about on today's show. I thank you all for tuning into the show, as you always do here on the Locked On Pirates podcast. Sorry that today's episode came out a little bit later than usual, but thank you guys for always tuning in. My name is Ethan Smith. You can follow me right there on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates. You can find this show on YouTube, Spotify, Odyssey, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, comment, like, and turn on your notifications, and also follow on Twitter again. And just share your comments. I always love reading your comments and reacting to them. So, folks, have a wonderful rest of your Thursday evening. I will see you on the flip side for our next episode. Have a wonderful day.